Touch that. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. So good morning. Silverman. Welcome back to Laredo. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we, I know we were, we have eaten into two minutes of, uh, it will not go, I guess it's Mr. Silverman's time, but it will go into our lunch time. So our lunch has now been reduced to 50 minutes instead of one hour. Yes. So we want to welcome Mr. Samuel Keith Selman as the next candidate. Uh, Mr. Selman, you have 25 minutes for your presentation, and then we will begin any questions. Thank you. Uh, the mouse will give me a pointer. Okay. All right. This uh, I brought a pointer from the other, other room. Yeah. If you could cue it up, that would help me a lot. I'd rather do that than just, but that's okay. Whenever you get it, just hand it back to me. Yeah, if you could, you know, we, we were having some issues. Some of us have gotten a little bit older and our hearing is not as good. Uh, so if you could speak clearly and, and loudly into, your, into the mic for your presentation or for your... Uh, which which your, uh, mic? You got two mics. Either one? Yeah, well, oh. you got two mics. I'll try to keep this volume right here. How does that sound? So far so good. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad we're finally here. This is uh, this is an exciting time for the city of Laredo, and it's an exciting time for me to have this opportunity to present to you and uh, and lay out uh, what I believe to to be the the credentials and, and the individual you're looking for to be your next city manager. With that, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. What I've done with this presentation is I followed, <laughs> I tried to follow as closely as I could. Now, I, I, I pulled some of the items together, but, uh, but I followed the email that I received in, in terms of the information you were looking for and the things that you wanted to hear from me relevant to certain topics. The first one was, okay, now I need the arrow keys. Thank you. That's what I needed. The, the first item on there was education. Uh, it's, um, there's, there's no mystery. I'm a Clemson graduate. Anybody that uh, has been around me for the last couple of years knows that. Anybody within a mile radius of me over the last uh, four or five years knows that. Um, 88 graduate. Uh, did my degree in urban planning there. Studied in Europe for a semester while I was there. I studied urban design and architecture in Genoa, Italy during my tenure there. So that, that opportunity presented itself uh, my last semester, and I took advantage of that. And that started my travels. Um, before that, I was at the University of South Alabama. I grew up at the Redneck Riviera, that's what I call it, a little town called Fairhope on, the, uh, on Mobile Bay. Fronts directly on Mobile Bay, and it's about 30 or 40 minutes from Gulf Shores. Now it's closer to an hour's drive, but when I was a kid, you could get there in about 25 minutes. The, and that degree is in geography, and then the, the graduate degree is in urban planning. Also went to the Harvard School up at Cambridge, and uh, that was done while I was here at the city of Laredo, serving as your planning director. The first topic that y'all had on the points of interest is our, our binational relations, and I couldn't help but drop my Peace Corps experience in here. It, it, just, uh, it just seemed to be a first-time fit. That is where my school also, when I was in Italy and going throughout Europe during that semester, but it was the Peace Corps where I had my very first international experience, really truly uh, an international experience. In, in those, and I was one of the last generation of Peace Corps volunteers that um, lived without communication. And I remember a letter to my dad. I asked him who won the Sugar Bowl. He wrote me back and said he didn't remember. And I wrote him back and said, if you don't tell me, I can't find out. <laughs> so, so I got that letter back from my dad. But anyway, the, um, that Peace Corps experience is really the first true international experience I, I've had. And it was a two-year stint in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. That might sound very romantic, uh, right up until you um, live under a mosquito net for a couple of years or, or that kind of thing and rampant malaria. And, so it wasn't, wasn't as great as it might would sound at the front end. Um, another place that um, I've had a lot of experience is in the transportation bills and earmarks. This is something that I did while I was here at the city of Laredo. And 
a lot of the things that we see out there is a result of some of that work. We have uh, the interconnectivity on loop, uh, on loop 20 and I-35. Loop 20 itself, a big portion of that was built with and we kind of constructed with earmarks that we got during a transition period between uh, transportation bills. It was the earmark heyday, I would, uh, that's kind of what I would refer to it as. And then the industrial street upgrade, I'm going to talk about this again a little bit later, but in the form, creation of the formulas, uh, as part of a reauthorization, we built formulas in and got a lot of money into the border money. We created the formulas specifically to address movement of commerce. So money came to a state that had a certain amount of commerce going across the border, international crossing trade. So that tied in and brought a lot of money. And what we did with that here, we spent a lot of that, about 19 million of that, on our industrial streets. So where you see concrete in most of our industrial parks, that concrete was put in as a result of that, uh, that language being brought into the transportation bills. The bridges, the World Trade, uh, World Trade Bridge, I was uh, involved in that. Uh, there is a, obviously a history here with our transportation. I might go into that a little bit later too. But, uh, but I was involved, I was on the team that, that worked on that uh, presidential permit and the design of that facility and making sure we had queuing. You might remember we had uh, trucks queuing all the way down I-35 to get southbound. And we have fatalities in that, uh, in that scenario, too. And one of the big things that we were very keen on as we got into the design of that facility was how to queue that traffic. And that's why you see that big circuitous. Now, getting, getting southbound is a much easier now than it used to be. But the, uh, that, that, all that queuing lane was uh, set to address what we were seeing on I-35. And, you know, one of the things that... Um, you're going you're gonna to hear me say this in a, mo in a moment as well. Our, our industry partners, and, and our most particularly the trade industry, we know that we are in a preeminent position as far as our trade goes. You're going to see that on another slide. That's part of our mission state. And that mobility and the mobility of those goods is key to our livelihood. <coughs> and so we've got partners on this side and across that as a city, we, we need to be, make sure that we're in partnership with those to keep those avenues of communication and dialogue open to make sure needs are met in that industry. And of course, every federal agency has a counterpart. So for every federal agency we deal with here, we've also got a counterpart in Mexico. I can't tell you what all of those are at this point in time or who those people are that I would need to be reaching out to and engaging with. But that, that won't take long to... to to get in a good box. Uh, again, this is legislative affairs. And, and here I just want to speak to a couple of things. Um, the biggest threat to local government is um, occurs when our Texas legislature is in session. <laughs> I don't know if you realize that, but uh, that is our one of our greatest threats. And um, and this past session, we were under attack as municipalities. There's no other way to put it. And they acknowledged those that were attacking municipalities said we're attacking municipalities. They made no bones about it. And they had a very unique disposition. If you look at the general disposition of how government should be. It was, it was people that were both so far right, they actually were left. It's kind of odd. But um, they had a Goldilocks and Three Bears kind of scenario. You've got you know, fed, federal government, too big. Local government, too small. State government, just right. And that's what they ran, we ran into at the state this last time. And they did everything they could to cripple municipalities and its abilities to provide services to communities. To, to the people that live in the communities hampered that, that, um, that ability to do that. And I'll be bringing that up a little bit later. It's probably the greatest challenge from a fiscal <coughs> issue. Official fiscal issue is your budget and what we're going to do with that three and a half gap. That's one of your biggest challenges coming up. 
Uh, another point, now I want to talk about that border and corridor. Um, th th for, there was a legislative, uh, when the one authorization bill provided for borders and corridors. In that, there was not much money for, for borders, even though we got one of the connectors that connect I-35 to Loop 20 and over to the bridge. Uh, we got one connector in that first, in that authorization bill. But it was in the next authorization bill that we made, hey, we pulled out that border uh, from the corridors because all that border corridor money, a lot of it went to Tennessee. Well, no one knows what happens in Tennessee, but anyway, they got a big chunk of that money. So we were able to pull out the, uh, the borders, get some formula locked into that relevant to the amount of commerce from the, tra the truck traffic or traffic crossing the borders, and that dictated how much federal money came to a state. Well, then the state went through the pro a very short process, because I was in the meeting, a very short process of deciding, okay, how are we going to delegate that across the state? Because they could spend it any way they wanted to. They could have spent that board borders and border money. They could have spent it in Lubbock if they wanted to. There was no mechanism in place to regulate where the state sent it. The feds just sent it to us. So as we were sitting around the table, and I was the only one from the city that was there, which isn't a slight on anybody, it just happened that I was the one there. Um, we're sitting around the table, and they're talking about this and that and the other, and I just looked at them point blank and said, how many of you went to Washington to make sure that we got this money in this state? And there was a long pause. And then I interceded on the pause. And I said, well, then we should use the exact same formula for the districts that the feds have assigned to the states. So we used that same formula base, and that's how the money came to Laredo. Laredo was the big winner in that process. And that was, uh, that was a good thing. Infrastructure, again, transportation trade, all of these things are inter interlocked. However, utilities and drainage um, are, might be two elements that um, we might not think of quite as readily in this infrastructure. But given the recent issues that we've had with water boil, uh, that water issue is suddenly something that is on the forefront. The, one of the unique things about my experience since I left Laredo was the city of Clyde. You would think city of Clyde, very small city, but we were a full service municipality. We had a water plant, we had a sewer plant, uh, and we had full distribution on all of that. A lot of small communities in this, in this state do not have that. But Clyde was unique in that respect. So, so one of the things that, um, so when I'm talking to Rhea or somebody in our utilities department, and we're talking about turbidity, I know exactly what he's talking about. When he's talking about residuals, I know exactly what he was talking about. I was one of the few professionals on the staff at Clyde, so we did have a water boil while I was there. I wrote up that water boil to DCQ standards and got that water boil out. I did the annual report that we did uh, that uh, you have to provide every, every year to your customers uh, on our water quality. I did that report. So I'm familiar with a lot of the things that happen in the water and wastewater treatment uh, processes. I know what it is when suddenly your sewer plant has, uh, is getting flooded and you've got water coming in from everywhere and you can't treat. And I know what it is that you have to do when you've got so much water you can't treat it. And the steps in that and, and the processes involved in notification of to TCEQ. That's the unique part. The drainage is a, is a utility that we oftentimes don't think about as a utility. It's key to everything that, if you really think about it, it's been key to our park system. Our drainage and, and park systems and creek systems are, are um, a big element of our infrastructure, and we have to maintain those and build more as growth continues. We have to keep our drainage going. Uh, roads, planes, trains, automobiles, bikes, and pedestrians, these are all things that, uh, that we need to, to be thankful thinking of as we build out our city. And uh, in particular, when I was on the MPO, and as y'all know, I was the uh, director of the MPO as well, just about every project that we did was um, designed to, for that trade industry. 
but we also spent a lot of money on local streets and we were able to do that through that formula money that I just mentioned. Those industrial streets are not on system, they're off system, but we were able to spend that money off system. <coughs> but one of the things that we have to do is that we have to, uh, we have to fund the maintenance of our existing infrastructure. It's, it's a must, it's not a, what do we, it, 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 there's not, the end game is we must, and we must find a way. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the, the way I looked to do it uh, while I was interim in the city of Corpus Christi, and I'll go over that towards the end of this presentation, what we did there. And then we need to um, adopt policies and ordinances that support these different modes. Uh, you can't say we want bike paths and then not develop policies and ordinances to create bike paths. You can't say we want just pedestrian-oriented developments and not develop ordinances and policies to get there. And Jeff just uh, Jeff just checked me off. Oh, another ordinance, you said. <laughs> Negative. <laughs> and um, and that, that's most evident, though, in, in our vision statement. Ensuring the prosperity of the community by maximizing Laredo's preeminent position as the largest inland trade hub of the Americas. This is right off the Internet. Now, there is a, there is a little story on that mission. Um, and I don't know that anybody in the room, there's a couple of people in the room that might have been in this meeting. We had our meeting down at the, the community college. They probably can't verify what I'm fixing to tell you. There's one person that could, and I'm going to name it, Rafael Garcia. He could verify what I'm going to tell you. We're sitting there, and the day is dragging, the day's dragging on. We're getting towards the end of the day at our retreat. And, and, and we've got a, a mission statement up on the board, and Rafael says, he draft a mission statement now. You've got to do it now. So... This is actually what I drafted. I gave it to Raphael. Raphael read it out, went up on the board, and it came out just like that. And uh, I remember Jaime Flores, he was just sitting there, and, and he was just going, preeminent position, preeminent position. He just kept mulling that over, and he was right. That is the key point of that statement. City operations. This is the organizational chart for the city of Corpus Christi that I developed when I was interim city manager. While I was interim city manager, I had two interim assistant <coughs> city managers. So, yes, I know you cannot read that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I'm going to break it down for you. What, what you see here is a couple of different things. You see the city manager having direct reports. And this is something that, that I feel strongly about uh, to some degree the city manager needs to have direct reports. Now, what they look like and how that is structured really depends on the, um, a couple, several factors, particularly the team that's at hand. But I, I think it's kind of like a, uh, like the, the head coach for an NFL team <coughs> that does the play calling or is intimately involved in the play calling. And it's a very similar scenario. You have to take on some of those responsibilities and some of those direct reports because there's a lot of things that need to get done in, in your organization. One of the ways I like to break down an organization is by internal services and external services. Your internal services are your IT, your HR team, your budget, your finance. All of those are internal service activities. You're purchasing internal services. Um, but then you've got your external services. You've got your planning department. You've got your building department. You've got all of these people that are involved in an external way. And breaking it down in those, those types of categories are key. And then you have a utilities branch. <coughs> you start putting solid waste and you start putting as a, as a utility, because it behaves very much like one. Um, you've got solid waste, you've got water, you've got wastewater, you've got storm drainage, you've got these things. These things can fall under a separate category. And that's what you see in yellow there in that structure. The middle one is internal services and the right is a little bit unique, I think, because my police chief, I brought my police chief up to be my interim uh, assistant city manager and to help out. And so I gave him a lot of those, uh, those folks that are out there, the health department, the library even, the parks department, the police and fire department. He, he took those on during that, that time period. And he did a great job. And we moved forward uh, with a lot of different stuff during that time period during that one year. Uh, transportation trade, again, uh, the MPO, and, and this is a comment I made earlier, just about every project 
every major transfer transition project <laughs> focused on moving goods. It's just something we can't lose sight of. Um, there's a history. I, I, I was debating how deep a dive I want to go into this on the history. And I start to age myself a little bit. Um, I can't age Jerry, though. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but one of the things that we, when I came to Laredo, and you all may remember this, uh, trucks were stacked up on Zaragoza. They were queued up on Zaragoza, rumbling down there and crossing Bridge 1. And then we had them on Bridge 2, and then we had the port down there, and then they were lined up on Bridge 2, and then we had the, the World Trade Bridge. And the Camino Colombia wasn't giving us much help because it was just too far out. A lot of it was very cumbersome to get there, and that's why we ended up with the Bridge 4. Still got empties, I suppose, coming across. And there may, there's still the port there, so it's got stuff coming across, but the empties is where we were using it a few years ago. I suspect that's still the case. Um, uh, the rail, now that I'm in Corpus Christi, I, I like having um, the rail story. There's so many people in Corpus Christi that don't know the rail story of even Corpus Christi and the Tex-Mex rail line and, and how that then turned into um, during the concession, actually had Mexican control, and then and then came over to KCS, and then the presidential permits they were chasing. There was uh, Union Pacific went out and got a presidential permit that would have permitted if they had got that uh, concession uh, for the uh, for the Mexican rail. That there would have been, there would have been a rail bridge in another part of the rail. They would have just veered off, crossed the Mines Road, and gone. Uh, and gone out uh, across the they, they, they got a presidential permit to do that. Uh, they did not get that concession, though. But the point is, um, the rail industry the, um, and our transportation industry is key to moving that commerce and that trade. Community health. I wasn't quite sure what, what the committee was looking for on this particular item. So I, I took it a direction that um, that I really want to, to kind of target that's never been done to my knowledge. Um, where a community is actually tying public space amenities and transportation infrastructure to address the public health crisis. We have a public health crisis and we know Laredo's not unique to it. It's across the country. Um, I might outlive my children kind of thing is what's going on with this health crisis. And the what are, is there a way to deal with that? And is there a way to deal with it effectively? And I don't know that it's, it, that there's people out there that are gathering data. There's people out there that are, that've got some ideas. But I've never seen something uh, that I, I mapped out here in this bullet point in terms of access to healthy activities being the critical part of the development processes. And then defining those modes of transportation as it relates to, well, to, to healthy activity. To healthy activity, we've got to tie what we're doing, our urban build out, tying it to healthy activities. And one way to do that is to incentivize it. Incentivize healthy infrastructure. <coughs> what that looks like, I have no idea. This is just an idea. Um, but it's this, incentivizing health, healthy infrastructure is the way to get there to address these issues. Did I get that check mark off on that or still still a check mark on that, Jeff? That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, um, We had allocated 25 minutes uh, for the presentation, so uh, you, you know you've got about three minutes to wrap it up, and then we'll go into the question. We can probably address them. Okay. All right. The next, the next slide is on ethics, and I've got two code of ethics that I live by. I've got uh, my AIC code of AICP code of ethics, and I've got my TCMA code of ethics. But the real question is, what makes up an ethical person? And, and uh, Webster defines it as a person who operates within a system of moral principles or values. That is your rudder. That's your rudder. That's how you do business daily. Um, here's some, uh, some additional thoughts on being honest, being fair, tell the truth, keep your word, exercise integrity. A couple of those deal with motive. Now, there is a difference between honesty and truth, and, and that's a function of motive. You, know, you can be very dishonest in your motives and never tell a lie. So there's, there's nuances to that. Keeping your word. You say you're going to try to, you know, you got, you got to do what you say you're going to do. Okay, employee labor relations. You might have seen this in my, in, in some of the things that I wrote, but as, as, you know, what government entities typically do is they punish failures to a greater extent than they reward successes. And 
this will take a managerial and leadership uh, shift because we, we need to focus on professional development training and personnel development. We need to develop a culture of public service. And the, and the culture of public service is, is um, customer service versus public service, in my estimation, are two different things, and the bar is much higher for, for public service. Uh, customer service, what's the main tenet of, a, of customer service? The customer is always right. That's not always the case in public service. The customer is not always right. And so the bar is much higher for a public servant. Okay, one minute. <coughs> Economic development. I've overseen type uh, terses, type A's, and type B's everywhere I've been since I lived here. Okay. Uh, fiscal responsibilities, fund balance, debt and credit rating, those are the big elements. Um, oh, did I skip one? Oh, I skipped one in my hand. Okay. Uh, collective bargaining. I'm CLR certified, CLRP certified. I suspect uh, uh, Christy could outline to you what that is. It's not an easy bar to get over. Uh, of course, Christy, police bargaining agreement, I was on that negotiation team which we just wrapped up and very successfully wrapped it up. Um, the next one is fiscal responsibility and, and budget. Again, Senate Bill 2, our biggest challenge, we've got a 3.5 cap, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna acquiesce to going to election or not? Um, budget's gotta be aligned to achieve objectives targeted to realize goals. So we've gotta have goals and we've gotta have objectives and that's how that budget should be structured. Measurement of track, tracking uh, the, that budget and incentives is critical. That's the primary task of, I would expect of an ACM. I expect an ACM to be tracking that with his departments or her departments to make sure that they're meeting those budget requirements. There were these, those things that were laid out in the budget. We need to become a destination city. We need to set a vision. Council needs to do that. They need to set that vision. What we need to do as a staff is, is set out and the course for achieving. Sustainable development. Actually, Laredo's got a pretty good, uh, pretty good record of how you do that. Uh, you grow like a mushroom. It's, believe it or not, there are municipalities, and I live in one right now, Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. where It's a long way between endpoints from the island to the other part of town can take you about an hour. And the reason it does is because they are so spread out. That's interstate the whole way. And uh, we gr we've grown like a mushroom, which has been a good policy. Education. May I continue real quick to skim through this, or do you want me to stop? Where are we? Are we at 25? I've been being. Why don't we go ahead, and I think I think the questions you'll be able to, I think by answering the questions, we'll be able to come back and address some of those okay. topics. We have, we have a total of 16 topics, all of which, you know, much of it is included in your presentation as well. So each of us will have an opportunity to address <coughs> each one of those topics by a okay. question. Okay. Maybe that's when you can elaborate more if you wish to we'll okay. back to your presentation. Okay. And I'm the lucky one I drew the first straw. I, will, <laughs> I, I, I asked the first question. All right. Okay. And uh, you got water, you feel free to sit, relax. Uh, 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 like I said, it'll be a total of this first wave will be 16 questions with the 16 topics. Okay. <laughs> uh, my area is in, is in, uh, in financial relations, international relations. So uh, you alluded to it in your presentation, but can you get a little bit more specific in regards to citing examples in your work experience uh, where you had to deal with uh, uh, government or private officials from other countries, which may have led to enhancing the economic well-being of the community? I think more specifically, can you share with the committee the, your experiences with government and private sector individuals from Mexico if you had that experience? You, where you interacted, where you have interacted or in, your, in, your, in your capacity, mm -hmm. in your experience, the roles that you had, where you had that, that, that experience of dealing with international private as well as public officials right. that, would, that created economic vitality to the, to the community you serve. You know, it, I was in, in all the meetings. But to say that I was the lead on those meetings is, is to, to not be accurate. Um, many of those meetings, like, you know, once you get into your uh, Mexican counterparts, it's in Spanish. That's not my first language. Um, not even sure it's my second. But, the, uh, but there is, uh, 
I was in those meetings and in those discussions as we worked out the World Trade Bridge and the presidential permit, um, was in those discussions and meetings as we were working on another presidential permit application down in South Laredo. But to say that I was the lead on those, no. But you have all your counterpart agencies uh, that you're dealing with on the Mexican side that you have here on the U.S. side. Okay. Any experience of that with, with Corpus and Corpus Christi or some of the other cities as well? I don't, we don't want, I guess, because we some of us aren't familiar with your role here in Laredo, but in, your, in, other, in other cities that you have, where you've actually uh, served or worked at, uh, any other experiences that you want to yeah, share? Corpus Christi is very far from the border, uh, both um, in, in nearly every respect. And uh, they, they do not interact or engage with any kind of counterpart groups over on, in the Mexico side. Uh, very seldom do you see it right now. Uh, the focus at the Laredo port, as an example, is, is fuel, energy, uh, exportation. Or any other countries, international foreign countries? No. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and continue. Uh, the script. Okay. <clears throat> Neighboring cities appear to be excelling in the area of development, infrastructure, and growth. As the city manager, uh, what you see are needed improvements in Laredo, and what unique plan would you have to improve development, infrastructure, and growth in Laredo? Which neighboring communities? Okay. Uh, we'd look at the San Antonio, the Valley, Corpus Austin. We just see growth going on, and we look at Laredo and we see we need to be moving this forward. Well, the first thing you need to make sure you've got is that you've got a, a, a business-friendly development process. And that doesn't mean acquisition, uh, acquiescence to, to, to developments. But it, what it does mean is a business-friendly environment. It's a cooperative process. Getting building permits, getting plans is a cooperative process. And we need to make sure we've got that on the front end. The back end, it, I'm, it, I'm, I'm a little bit, I think what you've got is you've got different things that influence those different communities. Okay. Now if you look at Corpus, one of the things that's driving Corpus right now is the industries coming in. Um, and, and they are energy related industries. You've got Exxon coming in, you've got a steel plant coming in. So the question then is, how are we competing with these other communities to attract true industry. We focused on transportation, but do we have, an, an, are we actively pursuing industry to come to our community? Because that's what's st st stimulating a lot of that growth that you're seeing in those other communities. Uh, the Toyota plant up in, uh, up in San Antonio was one of the, those boom factors. And, and then it just started, things really started blossoming. And, but we have to have, uh, I think, an answer to how it interrelates with with uh, me as a city manager and with our organization, we have to have that business mind. We have to embrace the growth of our community. We need to figure out as an organization what we're doing to restrict it. What are we doing to limit that growth? And then as a community, we need to take some ownership. Okay, what are we doing as a community to not get it? How did, how did they beat us? In relation to public improvements, what would you see we would be lacking or needing? Well, I, as, as we were going to go through the slides, um, the, the um, amenity packages, we really have to get our, um, let me see if I can find it. Well, the, the, key, the key point there is that we need to build, we need to think of ourselves as being a city that people want to live, work, and play. So, living side, work side, play side, and we need to target it from all, all of those facets to really draw people in. People have to want to come to Laredo. Thank you. And I think one, of, I was just, just driving around, I think a couple of the places that we could really focus on, on our image and our look is along that I-35 corridor. That's not, that's not a pretty sight coming into town. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't make you pound your chest. Uh, Mr. Duane, this is, this next, he'll be covering the topic of uh, 
Transportation. Um, Samuel, do you speak Spanish? Um, well, that's. Um, <laughs> See. <laughs> make it till you make it. That, that, that depends on where I am. Um, in, in, in Corpus Christi, I, I speak. People think I speak good Spanish. In uh, in uh, Abilene area, Clyde, they, they thought I spoke perfect Spanish. They thought I was fluent. Do you and, work and here, I don't speak Spanish at all. Do you work in Laredo for seven years? No, I worked in Laredo for nineteen. For what? Nineteen years. Yeah, Almost, 20. Casa, Almost 20 years. Yeah. 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 And, um, and, and it's, it's, I, I've got to share a story with that question, though. We were, we, we finally found a, found a restaurant up in the Abilene area that serves breakfast, a Mexican restaurant. In my estimation, you're not a Mexican restaurant unless you serve breakfast. Um, so, uh, so anyway, we were in this Mexican restaurant, and I'm going through all of my food groups, chilequiles, all of these things. I'm saying all my words right, you know. And, so the lady, the lady behind the counter looks at my wife and says, Tu esposo habla muy bien español. Y tú comes muy bien en español. Yeah, eso es solo tú. So anyway, what, she, what my, wife, my wife can't let that go. Her first language is Spanish. Veo que tienes so mucha experiencia. Veo que tienes buena experiencia en, en, en transportación, <coughs> en y que participaste en el Loop 20, en el Walter Bridge. Sin embargo, esos proyectos ya han sido rebasados por muchos, Samuel. El tráfico del Loop 20 lo ha rebasado, el tráfico de Walter Bridge lo ha rebasado. Eh, tenemos problemas de tráfico en Main Road, tenemos problemas de tráfico en, en Mile 13. ¿Qué podrías tú hacer o qué piensas para podernos ayudar? Creo que eh, Main Road tiene más tráfico que la 35 de San Antonio y que la de Corpus Christi. ¿Consideras algo sobre Mel Row? Hacer una federal, vías, en fin, anyway. Estuviste en envío también. Las preguntas son en la transportación y la congestión de Vines Road. Lo que estás apuntando es las roadways on-system. Y hay una diferencia entre las on-system roadways y las off-system roadways. Las roadways que identificaste son las on-system roadways. Son las roadways que maintained and operated by the federal or state. We typically just refer them to as state, state maintained roadways. And the, um, uh, the allocation for those roadways comes from the state. The state has different funding categories. All of that channels through the MPO. Now what we're looking at there, I'm, I'm sure that the frustration of our TxDOT folks, uh, both in the district office and maybe in, at the Austin area, is how do we, how do we increase lane width, lane count here, lane miles? because the, the, the right-of-ways are constricted through those corridors that you just mentioned. So that's what, what you're seeing is, is to address the inability to add lane miles is you're seeing grade separations and interface control onto those roadways. And that's a step one. Uh, step two is going to be, again, working through your district office, working through the MPO to identify projects that increase uh, reduce travel times, and that's what you're talking about, the congestion, increase travel time. You want to decrease travel time. So what has to happen there is the state's going to have to try to figure something out, bottom line. And we're going to have to take that initiative to them, what we want to see happen on those corridors. That is historically how it has happened. That's how we got Loop 20, period. Uh, we, loop, loop, loop 20 at one time was a line on a map. Okay. And then it was done, and it was all done in our initiative. There were talks at one time of an, of an outer loop, but that one actually went around the lake and may not help those congestion issues on the inside of the lake. So the, uh, those on-system roadways, what you have to do is let's start, let's start limiting access to reduce uh, those travel times if, if you're not able to increase lane miles. And by lane mile, I mean adding a lane. The way the tech stop thinks is by lane miles. So if you got a, a three a three lane roadway section and it's a mile <coughs> away, three lane miles. Okay. Okay. So now you add a fourth lane. Now you got four lane miles in that same one mile corridor. So that's what I mean when I say adding lane miles. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Keith, good morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, 
just to bring up today, I'm, I'm the CEO of Gateway Community Health Center, a federally qualified health clinic, very similar uh, to Amistad Community Health Center or Coastal Bend Community Health Center in Copeland. As you might well imagine and, and know, 30, about 35% of Laredo's population is uninsured, meaning no access to insurance, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no private insurance. What, in your experience, uh, has, have you done to help the uninsured population have access to affordable health care, both on the inpatient facet, the hospitalizations, uh, admissions uh, to hospitals, and to the outpatient uh, primary care part of the health uh, care uh, scenario? Never been in that swim lane. Okay. You know, I, I can't, uh, I, I just haven't been there where I was actively involved in dealing with the health, in, health insurance crisis and the treatment crisis that we have not been there. Okay. I have a, uh, oh, just a follow-up question, kind of yeah. in the same vein, uh, Keith. Uh, we have one of the state's highest health professional shortage area scores, uh, meaning we don't have enough uh, health professionals or physicians, if you may. In any of your past experiences, have you uh, helped in any of the recruitment of health care professionals to the community in any form or fashion? In well, it, it's a reach, but um, when we did the, I, I guess I can go to the airport master plan now that I give it a half a thought, but it's a reach. Um, because when you say involved, I'm thinking of, you know, where were you on the ground on get, helping people with the, the, med the medical issue. But uh, as, as we did the master plan, and I did the master plan, we identified that area in there as medical. That was specifically what we did, and that went to the, and I, you might have been on the airport board at the time. Um, and I did that master plan, identified those areas for health-related activities and health-related industries. And that was ultimately adopted by the uh, airport board and went on to, to be adopted by the city council, went on as part of all of the public improvements that they get from uh, the feds uh, being a former air base. They get money. Those monies went into a lot of those public improvements that went around there. I was involved in the EDA project that uh, it looked like a road project, and that's Bustamante. Bustamante was, is, uh, it was a road project, but it was what was under that road that made it an EDA project. We put a big water line in there to provide that service to that hospital when, Mercy, when Mercy, the Sisters of Mercy were building that hospital. Uh, that The roadway and the accessibility was critical, but that water line was the key to making that happen. Um, so from the standpoint of where I was and how, and of course all the planning of those projects and a lot of, a few of the building permits came across my desk while I was uh, part-time. I was over the building department about three and a half, four years. I was over the building department <coughs> and the development, uh, the planning process. So I knew about those projects, and those projects, and I worked with those projects through our processes. Thank you. Ms. Gill, I have a topic. Um, I have two topics, but I'm going to start with ethics, and you touched on it in your presentation, and, and you made a nice, uh, well, important distinction between being honest and telling the truth, which is very, um, uh, which, is, which I was, um, anyway, which was a nice uh, distinction and an, an important distinction. But what I'd like to know a little bit more about you and what your guiding principles are as they pertain to your morals and most importantly your ethics and that there is a <coughs> distinction between morals and ethics. Well, uh, the definition there gets you halfway there. A person who <laughs> operates within a system of moral principles or values. And then my last slide, which is a who I am slide, well, we didn't get to the which we didn't get to, but who I am <clears throat> and what I am first before I'm anything else is I'm a Christian. Okay, and really, no matter what happens, I, I'm, I am a providential Christian. Um, so the whatever whatever I do, I work at it with all my heart. This is straight out of Colossians three twenty three through twenty four as working for the Lord. So that, that changes my paradigm in terms of how I work and what I do. What I'm doing, I'm not necessarily doing for the city, I'm not necessarily doing for a council member, but I'm doing it for the Lord. And that changes the paradigm. That, that creates the rudder. The second thing I am uh, is, is a husband. 
Uh, my wife would argue that, uh, but uh, but I'm sticking with it until she knocks it off number two. <laughs> and then, uh, and, then uh, and then I'm a father, and then I'm a public servant, and just about in that order. That that is the order of business for me. I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a husband before I'm a father. I can't I can't be an effective father unless I'm an effective husband. That's my thought. Um, and then being a public servant, and 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 being in a leadership role, and and my objectives are to make people better. Follow up, Yes, sir. My question is regarding um, economic development. Um, we have an organization in Laredo called the Laredo Economic Development uh, Corporation, formerly known as the LDF. Uh, it consists of uh, board members who have a wealth of knowledge and, um, and expertise, uh, experience, and above all, success. They come from various uh, segments of our local business community, uh, banking and finance, uh, commercial development, commercial real estate, <coughs> international trade, warehousing, logistics, um, rail and transportation, medical services, manufacturing, oil and gas, and so forth. Um, I feel that uh, the city of Laredo could do a better job in um, uh, utilizing the uh, services of organizations like that, whether it be the LDF or LEDC or other groups, um, to uh, help us, you know, as we as we uh, seek, uh, you know, prosperity and economic development for this um, city. Uh, in your present or past roles, have you worked closely with organizations such as the LEDC? What are your thoughts about these types of organizations? And as an ex-Loreto city manager, what steps will you take to ensure cooperation and timely support is provided uh, by the city of Laredo to organizations such as the LEDC? Well, first let me start with, I agree with you. No, the, uh, I, I think you make a very valid point. One of the things that we have in Corpus Christi, well, let me back up to Clyde first. In Clyde, we had a type B, and I was the staff support for that type B. And it had very limited resources, but the danger with a Type B is that a Type B can come, become a community cookie jar because it is so liberal in its utilization. You can use it for almost anything, um, and so it, it's, it can be very dangerous. And the history of it had been that um, if one particular property owner wanted to put up a sign, they came in and made application to the EDC, and the EDC paid for their sign. That's the kind of thing that's really not helpful. You have to use those resources, your type A, your type B, to draw down uh, on and to bring industry in. The city of Corpus Christi is the primary contributor to the EDC, the Economic Development Corporation in Corpus Christi. And there are other contributors to that. Nueces County puts money in, San Patricio puts money in, um, a couple of the other communities across the Bay, Portland, they put a little bit of money in. But, uh, but that particular institution, the EDC, because we primarily fund it out of our Taipei, is, it is um, they serve as the clearinghouse for applications coming into Taipei or Taipei. But they also are actively recruiting. It's a result of that, it's the EDC's effort in Corpus Christi that led to Exxon coming. It's the EDC that led to a steel plant coming. That steel plant's going up. Both of these things are going on in, in San Patricio County. But it's the EDC that was the driver on that. When the port, it was the EDC. And, you know, just let me clarify. And, and there, let me, is, let me, there is financial support. What I'm referring to right. is involvement, interaction. No, and, and, but, but that's what I'm saying is that they are the clearinghouse. So when, let's say, there is a Type A project, the EDC reviews that. The EDC takes it by the board. Then the EDC makes a recommendation to the Type A board. And then the Type A board either approves it or does not approve it. Then it goes to City Council. All of these Type A and Type B monies, ultimately the City Council is the fiscal agent. So it goes through this vetting process before it gets to the City Council for funding. Now the City Council, conversely, can't dictate to the Type A or the Type B what they're going to do. All they, they have veto authority, and they, then nothing can get done. But they, are, they cannot just come up and and say, "You go, you look at that project, and you fund that project." That that's not the role there. 
and they understand that. So it's when you've got these this process in place that suddenly you're building that interrelationship of working towards common goals. Does that make sense? And that's my experience with how how it has worked, and it has worked very well during that tenure. As the city, as the interim city manager, uh, I signed off of and ensured that we were going to be able to provide water to both the uh, steel plant and to the Exxon plant. Mr. Buzz, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sam, <laughs> would you turn to your slide on public safety and collective bargaining? My question for my topic is specifically that. Would you share with us your experience in managing police and fire departments, unions, PACs, both uh, non-civil service and civil service uh, entities, as well as your experience in collective bargaining? The, for the collective bargaining, I, I think you need to know where you want to be going in. You, you've got to, well, let me back up. The first thing you want to do is to break break out your financial from your non-financial issues in your collective bargaining agreement and it's very good if you can work through all of your financial issues first this is language or this is other things that are in that collective bargaining agreement that are not hard to agree on uh, generally speaking sometimes they can be the, the, but, but the financial is where the rubber is famous so you work through those first and you, you do kind of like letters of agreement and you got okay we agree that that's where we're going to go we agree that that's where we're going to go so you do that process and then you come to you for the financial once you get to your financial side you need to know as as a city council the city council will provide some input to staff and that's typically done in executive session they make presentations and they start making some levels of decision on where are the caps are this is this is this is where that money can fall and so then you get your the, <coughs> the proposal from the, the other collective bargaining team, the, the unions, and then you take that and you do a cost on it. And that is key: is really knowing how to cost out the contract, and then you project that out for the life of the contract, and say, okay, this is going to be a twenty million dollar contract, or right, this is going to be a thirty million dollar contract, or it's going to be a fifty million dollar contract. And then that gets into your decision trees as you go through negotiations. For a little more clarity, I mean, you've had experience <coughs> in, in doing that specifically with. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was I was on the collective bargaining team with the city of Corpus Christi for the police. And expand a little bit more on, on the fact that you are a certified labor relations professional. Um, and how you get accredited to do that? And what what's the process, or, yeah, or you, what's the significance of it? You, why you, you why should I? take that into consideration that's, that's a perfectly valid question there's um, what you do is, is you go you go through a course in curriculum and and you take a test a certification test that's what certification is always a function of the test but what you're being tested on is your understanding of collective bargaining what does impasse mean when do you reach impasse all of these kind of words and and how collective bargaining occurs and that's that's what that certification is it's a process. It's a process. It's, a, it's, it's understanding the process of collective bargaining. Okay. Let's go back. Good, good uh, afternoon, Keith. It's good to see you again. Um, so my questions are related to um, sustainable growth and quality of life. And um, uh, as you know, smart growth is this philosophy around urban development that considers environmental sustainability, economic and social justice, and entrepreneurship, and really nurturing a class of entrepreneurs and developers uh, who can meet uh, the needs of the community and the future through the lens of sustainability, um, prioritizing things like multifamily developments, walkable, livable urban spaces, vibrant green spaces, and uh, requiring an intense dialogue and discussion among partners all of which requires government buy-in, and uh, some successful examples being Oak Cliff in Dallas, the Guadalupe Avenida Association in San Antonio, uh, among others. 
And um, you had interesting thoughts about this in your um, questionnaire, uh, question number two about this. So uh, the two questions are, I, I wanted to probe more your philosophy around um, sustainable growth or smart growth and development and giving us some concrete uh, specific experiences uh, that you have around that as well. You left off TODs. Which one? TODs. 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 Transit oriented developments. All of you that. left that off. Right. Very good. You went, you went down your list of smart growth stuff. I wanted to add one for you. The, um, you know, most of my experience uh, has been here in Laredo and on the development side. It's the uh, ACM and the city manager interim tenant period in the city of Corpus Christi was not, uh, didn't take deep dives into those development processes. And the answer to your point is that we've not done that as a community. We've not done those transit-oriented developments. We've not focused on, um, we, we've not focused on creating nucleus of activities. And, and in large part, because we've been, we, we wait on the development birds to come to us and someone might would say well a developer has never come to us with this proposal for us to get out of the way and see it happen uh, we, we've not had that um, and but I think one of the things that again going back to this cooperative process and the development process is I think you've got a planning team over there you certainly did when I was there that would be very keen on that but we didn't go out and try to make that happen with a developer. We didn't go out and tell a developer, hey, do this, do this, do this, try this, try this, let's do this. We need to create these nuclei of activities and events to create a sense of community and to do these types of things. We did not actively go out to, to try to stimulate that in the development community. If we want to do that as a government, we would have to provide incentives to make that happen. Can you can you, um, but would those, those incentives would be in the development processes. We've got a, a pretty nifty PUD project, which is as soon as you put a PUD on the table, it's almost no holds barred. Um, you're, you're negotiating everything from street size to sidewalks to densities to mixed use development. There's no holds barred in our PUD ordinance unless they've changed it since I've been gone. But that's, again, that developer has never come in and said, hey, I want to do a PUD that looks like giving your examples there. This is what I've seen in Austin. This is what I've seen in San Antonio. Or this is what I've seen in the Houston area. I want to create that here. But uh, as a city manager, I would, I would be very excited uh, to see this kind of development in our community. Because we've had a decent policy. That, uh, that uh, holding that sprawl in, yes. um, it was inadvertent. Really, we just did it with a club, to be frank. We said, we're not going to let you we're not going to let you. Uh, we're not going to give you access to water unless you petition for annexation. And so that way, the, the city did not leap out. The only place you really see a leap out is with Unitech. The rest has been much more mushroomed. So the uh, it's been a good policy from that standpoint. And and the when smart growth first started, the first words of smart growth was don't grow beyond your ability to provide services. That was the cornerstone of smart growth. Now, now it's evolved. Uh, smart growth has evolved into other life quality issues, and, and rightfully so, to, to add more meaning to that smart growth word. And I'm a planner. I'm a planner at heart. And, and just a follow-up question to that, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Keith, uh, um, I think strategies of the past in Laredo have been in a very top-down kind of fashion. And so uh, what have been uh, concrete examples or experiences you've had where you've really tried to um, have these intense discussions or engagement uh, within the community about <clears throat> the way growth happens, either not necessarily for the community in general, but maybe certain neighborhoods or specific projects um, uh, to get all of their uh, buy-in from the onset as opposed to at the tail end of everything? Yeah, this was, um, this was one of the questions in the questionnaire relevant to the holistic community approach. And, and I've not seen that in, in practice. 
Uh, FEMA came up with that a as part of how to deal with flood related issues. And, but applying that and getting a holistic approach and bringing in all of those stakeholders, that's awesome. That's exactly what you want to do. That's the only way you get your community, you decide, that's the only play, that's the only way to really be able to decide, number one, where you want your community to go, and then number two, how to get it there. Mm -hmm. It's in that forum that that happens. Uh, Corpus Christi is much more involved in public engagement with activities than, than we have historically been here. And they do that in what way? Identify the, um, the first thing you do is you identify your groups. You know, who are your stakeholders out there? And who are the people you can you can bring in to start engaging? Stakeholder identification is number one. Then, once you've passed the stakeholder identification, you just it's just a straight up. It, you know, it's one of those things that my father told me every now and then. I'd ask him, "How do you do this?" And he would say, "What do you mean? How do you do it? You just do it." And mm -hmm. so that public engagement suddenly becomes something you just do. But you use all the avenues that you've got to, to do it. You use your Facebook page. You to use your use all your resources that you have because even with all of those resources whether it be mail or public meeting or or, or emails or, or um, text blasts or whatever it may be your Facebook page whatever that out Twitter all of those things you there's still a group a population out there you're not going to get and that's that's the one you you just it's it's that's the one that's the most frustrating how do I communicate with that individual? How do I get them in and make them a player in this process? And everyone needs to understand that it's going to be an open process. Sometimes what can happen in those environments is that people are highly skeptical of the, again, we go back to motives. We go back to the ethics side of it. People are, and this happens a lot in, in Corpus Christi, quite frankly, very skeptical about why are we having this meeting? Why are, what is the city's motive? The mm -hmm. city as an entity, what is their motive? Mm -hmm. and there's a question of motive and, it, and you know, and, and we, we all suddenly become conspiracy theorists. <laughs> you know, we all start, you know, okay, they're doing this and this and this and this and everyone suddenly is building conspiracy. And, you know, I say it simply, I'm just not smart enough to conspire. You know, it's way too much work. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so the idea there is to make sure that it's open, make sure that it's honest, make sure that it's clean. You got to have that. If you don't have that, you got nothing. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Okay, Keith, you know that uh, Laredo has one of the top five um, school districts: UISD. You have LISD, the inner district. You have the early colleges now, uh, since you've been gone, we actually have a lot of early colleges within our different high schools in LISD and in UISD. We have LC South, LC North, we have TAMIU, we have San Jose, we have Harmony. Uh, what joint projects have you participated in with other governmental entities that have enhanced the economic and social well-being of tomorrow's workforce? Provide ex examples of memorandum that you participated Created that enhances the opportunity for a strong workforce. Okay, I, I, I switch back to my economic development slide. That is one of the key elements of that Type A. Uh, type A has funded activities at the community college oriented towards the industry, and the Type A has funded classes, the mechanical engineering school over at the university at uh, at uh, in Corpus Christi, and direct ties. I was overseeing those things as they were coming through the type A and processing to the type A and then to the uh, city council for funding. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you don't mind, there's a lot of work with that. I understand when it comes to the university part of it, but when are we going to, when are we going to learn that, you know, it all starts at the middle school to the high school to prepare our kids to go into those kind of fields. And if we wait till, if we wait till they get out of high school to get to the university, we lost a lot of time. Where kids can come, uh, graduate from high school, which we're concentrating right now in both school districts, to train them so they're in the workforce a lot faster. And then once they're in the workforce, companies are looking at that. Companies look at what they kind are. of workforce you have that, so we have the opportunity to open a bigger, bigger industry within our communities. One of the things that, and, and you point that out, you landed on you finish that on the exact right topic. 
There is industry, there's education, there's government, and there's the instance. So there needs to be, and that's exactly what we've got in Corpus Christi, a team approach in terms of where those three come together. The things that the economic that the Economic Development Corporation is reviewing for Type A and what's coming before Type A is projects that are oriented towards preparing people for the workplace and for industry. And some of those are tech related. They're not all university related. Some of them are tech related. Uh, they're going over to the community college as well. So it's it's not it's not just rigid into the mechanical engineering program over at the university. It's also the technical activities that they have to have. And these are good paying jobs. These are eighty, ninety thousand dollar a year jobs to get the, that technical know how on, on different machinery in order to work at those refineries and those plants in Corpus Christi and the Exxon plant that's coming and the steel plant that's coming on as well. I wondered where this, this point might be going. Um, and as far as uh, there absolutely has to be, everyone's got to be on board. In other words, there has to be line of communication and be on board. We, we have to be marching to the same tune and we've got to be going in the same direction to everything you described there. The only way you do that is through communication. Communication is the key. There has to be an interrelationship between those school entities and the government, particularly as we get into municipal, into municipal government helping to fund activities that the school is identifying. And that's really kind of where the rubber meets the pavement is money. Um, where does the funding come from? A lot of people can think of programs to get where you're going and what you're talking about. And But can the school districts afford it? And if they can't afford it, to what degree should the government step in, whether it be municipal, county, or state, step in to help subsidize that, to make that happen? That is exactly what the Type A and the Type B are set up to do. The, But aside from that, you've also got the activities of our, the things that we do as a municipality. So how do you make, uh, how can public services and how do public services interface with ed education and information dissemination and, and information accessibility? One of the things that we talk about quite a bit, and it's still out there, is the divide, the technological divide. Some people have access to the technology and others do not or they don't exercise access to it. It may be there, but they're not exercising that access to it. So how do you get them engaged in that? So you do that through our library. They've got resources and programming. They're spearheading some of that. You do that through parks programming. Our parks department in Corpus Christi does a lot of things like that where they're working in coordination with the library, and that's a lot of nature stuff going on there. Public safety with direct engagement, one of the things that I would really want to see is is uh, our police department getting much more involved in the schools. I don't know how involved they are right now, but in Clyde, my police chief taught a class at the high school. So every kid at the high school knew who their police chief was. The uh, 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 public safety uh, through direct engagement again, and health through programming and information dissemination. The health department is key in this. They, they also have a very nice budget for getting information and disseminating information. And part of that can be Part of that public that, that that engagement and involvement that you've described. Thank you. Next topic uh, is uh, involving uh, legislative affairs. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in your experience in city government, do you consider valuable for city government to contract or hire government affairs representatives? Uh, or individuals <coughs> or individuals at the state and federal level uh, and, and no, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go on that you don't have to do an and yet okay. go ahead with your hand uh, I was just gonna say more specifically you want to share the examples where the where uh, such hires have proven to be a positive effective, <laughs> or ineffective. effective or ineffective yeah um, there's a uh, one of the things that my, my knee jerk to that is actually where some of the people were in Austin. That no, the municipal government shouldn't be involved in hiring. But when the state government is so aggressively trying to erode a municipality's ability, and aggressively, there's no if, ands, or but, it was straight aggression, aggressively uh, erode 
a municipality's ability to provide services to their citizen, a municipality has to reach out and get some help. How do I deal with this legislative process? How can someone, someone needs to help them? Because they, they frankly can't afford to have somebody sitting there in Austin on a daily basis. And so having someone there in Austin every day with their nose to the grindstone or in uh, Washington with their nose to the grindstone, knowing exactly how these things are unfolding and being able to alert us as a municipality, because they don't, you know, they sometimes they're on retainer, sometimes they're by the hour, but they really don't get engaged on something. They, they, they flag it, they see it, they let the municipality know, this is my experience. And then the municipality decides whether or not they want to take issue with it or not. Okay, yeah, we've got to get engaged on that one. And then you start engaging your your delegation, and you start sometimes sometimes that can be a policy issue. Our, our guys on the ground may not know what's happening at HUD, or may not know what's happening with EPA, or may not know what's happening with TCEQ. But it's these guys that have got their antennas up, they're right there on the ground, and they make you aware of those things. And then you decide as a policymaker, and the city council, or the, whoever the government entity is, and they decide whether or not they need to, to hire someone to address that. I've seen great success with that, and great success with earmarks. I go back to the earmark era of transportation. We got a lot of those earmarks because we had somebody on the ground make that happen. If uh, we wouldn't have got Loop 20, there was, uh, I forget the exact multi-million dollar, but it was, it was uh, north, of, uh, north of eight digits to, to get the loop pushed down further south. When that project was getting earmarked, that money was going <coughs> somewhere else. And we had our guy on the spot, he knew exactly where our agenda was, he knew exactly what we wanted, and he intercepted that and got it placed into that loop project. But do you That's see an it? example of success. An example of failure. Um, sometimes, and I, I don't want to call, I'm not calling any names out here, yeah, I guess you noticed that, but, uh, but we have had consultants, and I've seen consultants work that they're not doing very much for you. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're not putting their finger on the right people, um, and, and what your, your initiatives are fall by the wayside because you hired somebody that couldn't push the right buttons. I've seen that, but let me let me let me go one step for further here. I don't. I have not seen anybody do this better than Laredo. Corpus Christi does not do this as well as Laredo does. That's my observation. Now, when it comes to getting that delegation mobilized, when it comes to, we had to. I was involved in the team that was up protecting Corpus Christi's interest in the port this last session. And I'll summarize it with. San Patricio was making a very hard push to increase the number of port directors, or, or port uh, members, and they wanted more representation on the port board. And, and the city of Corpus Christi felt very much inclined to go to Austin to prevent that from happening, to, to protect the interest of the port. But they, but they really were playing catch up on it. It was a, I say playing catch up, it was reactionary. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen from, and, and they really don't operate a lot in Corpus Christi in terms of getting in front of something. It's reactionary. That's where I've seen Laredo as being different, is that Laredo gets out in front of a lot of issues. Yeah, so the follow up is do you see it more as a defensive mechanism hiring these folks or as, a, or as an offensive mechanism hiring these folks? Yes. No, it can be either. Both. There you go. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Keith, you, uh, would you expand a little bit more on your your own personal management style and and how it might specifically um, relate to managing council, managing department heads, managing staff? And maybe cite an example of how you would deal with some uh, decision conflict uh, between. Council, department, yourself, staff, so forth. And that, that was the one question that wasn't hit. <laughs> Management styles wasn't up there, and neither was leadership. 
and I, and I felt that that was a, a gaping hole in terms of this process. What Keith, what does your leadership look like? What does it, what do you view as leadership? I've got a couple of points on leadership on this side. I got these accomplishments to the left. I'll come back to those at some point in time if I get a wrap up moment. But the, um, on the leadership, these are just some quick points. And these are, these are coming out of my head. Um, you know, failing is, you can fail. You can succeed. But the real challenge is always in trying. The real challenge is in the effort. The real challenge is in the decision to, to, to go for it. That, and that's where the risk is. <coughs> if, if someone succeeds in everything they do, every time they do it, they never took a single risk. Those things were going to succeed anyway. But um, risk, by definition, necessitates a, a level of an opportunity to fail. Otherwise, there's no risk. By definition, it's not a risk. So in defining leadership, look, let's look at the left column first. A leader is someone who does exactly what we want, exactly how we want, and exactly when we want. Not really, right? Not really. But um, is is that is that reality? Let's take a look at the reality of this, and then on, and then right below it, do um, and and we reward that person by actually giving them the title of leader. You did exactly what I want, exactly when I want, exactly how I want you to do. You are a great leader. Take this. I, think I got this glass trophy for you. So that's not leadership at all. That, that's somebody that follows somebody else. And I actually saw that in action. It was really funny. Um, I saw somebody put their hand on somebody else's shoulder and they said, and with your leadership, we're gonna do great things. And what that means is with my leadership and with your following my leadership, it, we, we're gonna do great things. That's really what that meant. But on the right hand <coughs> side, now let's look at the right column. A leader is someone, um, who took you to a place you either <clears throat> did not expect to be or want to be. Think about that, mull that over. These, these again are coming out of my head a little bit. Um, I, I don't think a, a leader is necessarily a pronoun. It's not you're a leader. Leadership can occur anywhere, anytime. Um, and, and really does. We just don't even see it or even acknowledge it. And we've got people in the field and utilities that are out there in the field and they're making decisions every day and they're exercising leadership by making those decisions. Um, I, I, I really lean to a, more of a creative leadership approach. What I would like, um, what you have to do is you have to create an environment that's conducive to creativity. And, and a lot of times what someone that is in a managerial role or a leadership role, they show their cards first. And that becomes too easy for the people in front of them to acquiesce to. When you ask somebody, well, what do you think about this? Why? Well, and, and, and then you follow that question with telling them what you think. Well, there's a good chance, if you're in a leadership role, that you're going to get that answer thrown right back at you. And so you have to create an environment where you're willing to accept the creativity of others. And in fact, taking it one step further, my expectation is that I'm made uncomfortable. That's my expectation of directors. That's my expectation of my ACMs. Not that I'm looking to take them out of their comfort zone, which I will, but that I want them to take me out of my comfort zone too. Challenge me to take a risk and get and give me real good reasons for doing it because I'm not going to take a risk. No, but, but you see what I'm saying, and, and I think you're getting the gist of that. And, and um, one of the things that we, we oftentimes do is we, we want to stay in that comfort zone, even as leaders. What a leader want, you know, the leaders, they, they suddenly have that as a pronoun instead of a verb. It's not leadership anymore, it's just leader. I'm the leader. And then all of a sudden, that creativity comes out of it. That engagement comes out of it, and it is a constant effort to push, to, to not push your will upon others. That's the greatest challenge in, in leadership. 
is to not push your will above upon others because as soon as you do, you're not going to get it back. That way. That's Thank you. The, well, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> the uh, Mr. Bridges? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Bridges? Well, well, wait a minute. Let me let me let me follow up on that. I still got some points on that. We had a couple of um, one of the questions in the questionnaire, and it was an 18, 19, 20 point question. One of them was on that that leadership, and 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 I leadership and management, and I I listed four. All I did was boom, 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 boom. One, two, three, four, and it was servant leadership true empowerment, team building, and culture building. Two of those are leadership and two of them are management. Okay. Servant leadership, that's leadership. Culture building, that's leadership. But true empowerment, that's part of that management leadership line. And then, uh, and then team building again, part of that management leadership line. Where, where is that line in the sand? Thank you. Yes. Hi, back to the international breaches. I'm back to speak Spanish. Hemos visto que los cuatro puentes ya excedieron su cruce. Hay mucho mucho tiempo para cruzar por los cuatro puentes. ¿Considerarías hacer una expansión a cada uno de los puentes o la creación de un puente nuevo? ¿Y cuánto cuesta uno? ¿Cuánto cuesta el otro? Eh, pero que no le cueste a los residentes de Laredo. No more taxes. <laughs> That they may be at capacity. Would you consider expanding the existing bridges, or perhaps consider a new bridge where it would, the cost would not be incurred by the taxpayer? Well, I think in either case, it's not incurred by the taxpayer. In either case, it would come out of the enterprise fund of the bridge. Uh, the bridge floats; it pays for all its own debt, um, so it would it would come out of there. The uh, I think that I think I'm right in that. I used to be right in that. Okay. The um, but I think uh, I think there's a lot of variables in that decision tree that I don't have the information to. I can't give you an answer and quantum an absolute answer at this point. And here's why: because I don't I haven't looked at the data, the bridge crossing data. I haven't looked at the queue data. What's the, how long has it taken us to get across those bridges? And if, in looking at that data, would I then be able to determine whether or not an additional lane will fix it? More pedestrian space? Isolation of just the pedestrian bridge and creation of a new bridge? A lot of those things would come into that, uh, that decision tree. And one of the things that I would come in there is that, that pedestrian bridge concept, just pedestrian bridge and then <coughs> lanes. That's been talked about now for a couple of decades or more. Um, so those are the kind of, kind of things that have to get engaged in that. And then locating that spot, that location, where, where do we put that bridge and what's that bridge intended to do? Is it intended to get, um, to get southbound or northbound? I mean, because they, they've, got, they've, got, they've got northbound problems in Mexico too. Uh, those lines over there to get, a, get across are, are pretty long. So is, is our customs process is driving the need for more bridges? Is the Mexican custom process is driving the need for more bridges? Can, can it be fixed somewhere there? as opposed to, to more infrastructure. Those are the kind of things I think we should look at before we, we jump into a bridge project. Uh, we need to know if it can be solved other places. The bridge project is the most expensive project. And amending a presidential permit sometimes can be easy, sometimes can be difficult. Uh, we went through an amendment process. That amendment process was consummated right after I left, but it was required of us to amend the, to, to put hazmat on bridge number four we had to amend that presidential permit. And uh, TxDOT really was not all that keen on that. Um, they wanted to keep that hazmat out at the uh, Camino Colombia. And that was, uh, that was a, a field that had to get plowed. I left just as that was getting, getting transitioned on and, and was getting done. But that was a, uh, that was a challenge to, to amend that presidential permit uh, because other agencies were not in support of that. 
uh, without other activity. And that's why you have now have the outer, the, the loop, loop 20, designated as a hazardous cargo route because of the amendment to the presidential permit that occurred for Bridge 4. We had to do the risk assessment, and then doing the risk assessment, we had to submit that, get that squared away, do those levels, do those levels, and what you do is you take a mile swap of the roadway, and then you see what the populations and commercial areas and risk to the population is in those areas and in order to establish that route. So there was a lot of work that went into establishing that route in order to get that presidential permit Okay. Okay. I, I, I want to expand a little bit on my committee health question because I'm not sure Go ahead. Go ahead. I want to approach it from an economic development point of view. I, I'm not sure that you maybe understood my, my uh, question Okay. on community health. Uh, you are aware in Corpus Christi, um, you have several large hospitals, you have Driscoll Children's Hospital, right. uh, a very large pediatric care hospital that has outpatient clinics not only in the Valley but in Laredo, believe it or not. Uh, in fact, they have five clinics here. Um, you have a large uh, trauma center, trauma two center at Memorial, if I recall correctly. Large uh, uh, hospital on, on Christmas Santa Rosa, uh, Christmas uh, Healthcare, uh, on uh, Ocean Drive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm assuming Corpus Christi has a, a, a health department. We so do have a health department. All that has created economic development. You, you create those different uh, services uh, as, as Driscoll has. the health department in Corpus Christi led to the expansion of Spawn. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just saying that all of that uh, is an economic driver. Yes. Uh, Driscoll oh, yeah. Health, 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 health services has is a large, huge economic driver. Uh, a large pediatric uh, residency right. component. Right. All that brings in new doctors and creates right. health care access. Right. Same thing with your trauma level two. Right. I'm just saying, you know, could we have some of that here eventually some of those uh, services here uh, we're trauma level tr three in both of our hospitals uh, we have we're starting to have residency programs believe it or not but it's brand new mm -hmm. but uh, could we expand that I'm, I'm, that's what I was doing. if you were familiar with what you've done uh, in Corpus Christi over the years to have that as not only uh, access to health care but also as an economic development driver because Believe it or not, healthcare is big in Corpus Christi, yes, it uh, and it is here too. <laughs> yeah. As you know, Spawn just did a reconstruction over it, and I think that's what you're referring to. And, and kind of the tenor of that question is how how deeply was the city involved in that? Right. Um, uh, the city was involved again, very similar to the to the project here with the infrastructure around the hospital. That's where uh, the city stepped in for the most part, They're doing reconstructions on, on the roadways around the hospital, getting access into the hospital, making it. Yeah, that was a big challenge because you yeah. were, that house was almost yeah, landlocked. Spawn, I mean, Spawn, Spawn, Spawn didn't have a lot of space. Right. right. And they had, to, they had to build a hospital. Mobility issues. And, and as those roadways were getting reconstructed and they're still under construction, the there, there was an intense coordination between the hospital contractor and the city of Corpus Christi. That was, that was an actual constant engagement in terms of how to deal with the circulation around those hosp that hospital. And I, I just think that's a real example of how the city interfaces with that. Um, the city didn't go out and, and, and try to get more residency. They didn't necessarily do that. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with David's work here, Dr. Garson's work on, on that residency program, um, getting that thing up and running. Uh, also, the uh, I think we had uh, in, in Corpus Christi very recently we had uh, had some issues with our um, with with the Social Security benefits, and we lost some positions in our community. Uh, it was just over programmed. Uh, nobody fault of nobody's. It was just money that was thought was going to be there. <laughs> um, but those are the kind of things, and and the federal and we can can go back to some level of discussion on that federal legislative side as those monies come into communities, Social Security in particular, going back to engaging our legislators and our, our groups there 
to, to see about getting those resources necessary to ensure that our population has a, an acceptable ratio of physician to population. Those are the kind of things that we could we could do as a community and as an organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if I got there even still. Yeah. Yep. All right. You're getting there. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get them. Uh, my question has uh, deals with employee and labor relations, and you kind of touched on it with your uh, management style. And if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about that, you know, that would be great. But I want to particularly um, speak to you about, I'm sure you know about the instability we've had in the recent years, um, where we've had a high turnover of city managers. And I'd like to know how you would address improving employee morale. How would you motivate your employees? Engagement. That's where you start. Um, you start with engaging the team. And you have that expectation of your directors. Uh, again, uh, I go back, actually, where this goes to is, is these ideas of cultural shift. This paradigm shift is exactly what I'm, what, what in line with your question there. If you've got a, if you've got a team that is indifferent, or is complacent, and we need to transition that team to public service, how do we get them there? At first, it starts at the top. It has to start at the top. Nobody can look at your city manager, nobody can look at your assistant city managers, nobody can look at your director and see complacency. They can't see somebody just moving along, just in the, in the flow of the game. They have to be seeing someone that is a public servant. So what we've got to do very early on is, in part of that paradigm shift, is to, to bring that management team, that leadership team, into that paradigm. That's where it starts. And we do that with, not just with workshops, and we do team building. We do a lot of that stuff, and we'll have to, we'll have to do <coughs> team building things. We'll have to redefine. But first, we'll have to define. We will need to define who we are. And this is what that journey will look like. You're saying, how do we do that? This is what that journey looks like. We define, and we constantly redefine the culture. We see where we are, and then we shift from it to a public servant, then you have to build it into your system that you're building those leaders and you're building those, those people uh, on your team that have that public service mantra. You're building those, and you're building those to replace you. Even as a city manager, if I'm not finding my replacement, I'm failing. And that applies to every director in the organization, every assistant director, every manager, every division hit anyone that has somebody under them and if they're not training someone to take their place they're training they're failing them not just training but culturally shifting them they're failing and turning them into public service being a public servant and recruitment's a big deal we need to we need to bring in and keep we've, we've got a lot of people in this order there's a lot of people in this origin that are very committed public servants i don't want this to go negative here at, at all there are I mean, the team is loaded with people that love this community and love this organization and want to see the greatest things happen. And but that also happens with recruitment too. You need to buy, you, need, you you need to be recruiting and looking for certain traits for this kind of buy-in and for this kind of um, leadership development. And then we need to develop those executive leaders. And again, servant leadership. I mentioned that earlier. But then customer experience, one of the things that has to be focused, because now this thing becomes circuitous. That's part of that de redefining. Um, what is our customer's experience? And our customer is the population at large. And I'll get into a couple of trust factors, some of the other things that we need to be looking at. But one of the things that, that we got an issue with is trust. Um, the mayor mentioned it in an interview the other day. Um, he said, well, I've gone through this, I've gone through a process of trusting. Um, and and if we all go through processes of trust. And but what what does that? How how is that trust element broken? How does how do you break into that wall? And 
it ain't that easy. Uh, you've got a, a council that doesn't trust staff, a, a community that doesn't trust um, their government. You've got a community that may not trust their government to provide services. And there are certain departments that, that are the image of our community. And they're doing a great job out there. I, I pulled over and asked a police officer. There was a jog up there. I was up on Hillside this morning. So there was a run through there, and there was a car show there in that parking lot, uh, the old transit center. And uh, I just stopped in and spoke to the police officer that was there because they did some traffic stuff, I guess, a few years ago. So there was a fatality in one of these jogs. So they, we've gotten much more aggressive in terms of how we quadrant off these, these type of events. There was a 5K run. So I just stopped and talked with him perfect face of the community. He totally engaged me. Um, and uh, that's that's the kind of guy we're looking for. Okay, we still have three topics that we need to cover in the next uh, review of Mr. Bonds. Keith, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Keith, in your experiences, or can you share with us your experiences uh, working with or dealing with sharp declines in revenue or unanticipated budgetary constraints? Well, um, yes, <laughs> it gets it gets hard. Uh, there's a... Um, have you had experience one, with that? Have yeah, you let plan, me, do you have me, a plan for that? Let me, let me, well, you can plan for it. Given, given that we have a hot economy, I, I prefaced it the last time for the last candidate for yeah. that question. Yeah, there's, there's, um, I had it, and then, then I lost it just then. Sorry about that. Um, it's not going to come back either. So, not yet. <laughs> all right, repeat your question. I bet it'll come back. So, let, me, let, me, let me state it this way. Given that we have arguably a hot economy, everything that goes up has got to come down at some point. Mm -hmm. You have experience, or can you share a plan with us in the event that we're dealing with a sharp decline in, in revenues? or unanticipated budgetary constraints, right. legislative, like right. you mentioned earlier. Like what we're fixing to run into. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that has to happen is managing expectations. When you're in a budget cut situation, you have to manage expectations. This goes into how we engage our community. Because um, one of the things I've noticed specifically in Corpus Christi, much different, I think, than Laredo, although I think the needle's moving, a good bit in Laredo now, but there's not there. There's a huge expectation in the park system. Huge expectation in the park system in Corpus Christi, and more typ typically, those expectations exceed the amount that someone's willing to be taxed to provide those services. So expectations exceeding a willingness, somebody needs to do a gut check on that. Okay, we can provide that services. Are you prepared to pay for that service? That's the first thing you got to know is where those thresholds are in your community in terms of what the threshold is for taxing because almost anybody will tell you, well, when you get a revenue slump, you increase taxes and you offset your revenue. All that does, that, that, takes you, that can take you further downhill. If you're in a long, if you're into recession, all of a sudden you keep taxing, you start eroding your tax base um, and then you're not competitive with the San Antonios of the world and the Corpus Christi's of the world and the Austin's of the world and all of these cities that blossomed, um, you're, you're not competitive with them any longer. So how do you, um, uh, when you're working with, do you plan for it? I, I wouldn't say that you plan your budget for it, except that we might be planning our budget for it now. First of all, Senate Bill 2 moved our, moved our budgeting process about six weeks. Does that sound right? About six weeks? Slid that process six weeks south towards us. That's the first thing that happened there. But is the city prepared to go out on an election? When, and when is the city ready to go to an election? So those contingencies might be built into the budget process now, just purely based on that. Whether elect and then if it goes out to referendum, does it get approved or does it get denied? And then how do you, you almost got to have two, if you are making a decision to go to referendum, you better have two budgets in your fist. It's not really what I was looking for, but I'm, my question is more along the lines of an unexpected sh sharp drop in revenues. 
What do you do with that? I mean, well, assuming just, if, if it's unexpected and it's short term, you, this is what been, you do. do you, well, yeah, well, let me, let me try to get there. Do let, you, me, let, no, me, let, me, let me explain. I got explain. it. Maybe. <laughs> okay. The peso devaluation, the Eagle for sale, things that affected our hotel motel tax funds, those kind of things. What do you have experience in dealing with those types of, even if they're short term, right? You know, short term for for some two three years, um, may 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 harm a city beyond recovery. Yeah. Okay. Instantaneous, short term, um, un unexpected. Those are my parameters in the question. The um, at, as you're looking at your budget, you, you figure out how to put the brakes on, because your budget your budget is a one year budget. So now you're operating from, you were originally operating on a one expected revenue, and now you're working on another expected revenue, and it's lower. It's a much lower revenue. So what do you do? You, you look at your hirings. And th these are things that everyone will typically do. You'll look at your hirings. You'll look at how you're going to deal with salary savings. You look at your project listings, uh, because you budgeted for that. You were expecting to spend that much money that year, and now you're not going to have it. So you've got to drop that down, and in dropping that down, you've got to change those expectations too. This isn't going to happen now. This isn't going to happen now, and this isn't going to happen now. There's some, there's some very, and, and the last place you want to get to is your team. Once you start to, your teams, it, I say go to a hiring freeze, but you've got to be careful with a hiring freeze because you can debilitate a team by having a hiring freeze. You can suddenly, and this is where the, man, the, the, the department heads come into play. They're recruiting. They got a four-man crew. They're recruiting. They can't recruit. They got two vacancies on a four-man crew. That crew's debilitating. And suddenly, whatever they were doing, they're not doing anymore. So now they got to move to another crew. And that's what that man that turns into management. How do we manage that process? How do we lead through it? But the last thing you want to do is start furloughs. You don't want to, you start furloughs, you start cutting people. That's not a place you want to be. Because what that will lead to is a, a demoralization of your workforce. And you can't simultaneously be trying to build public service and demoralizing them with cuts. Ms. Cortez. Quality of life, Keith. Just what are some ideas that you have on how we can turn the page begin a new chapter and vision for the river are we talking about quality of life or even economic development there's a uh, there's a section of the river over there that has some rapids some of you may be familiar with it some of you may not but when when the uh, when the border patrol was out there clearing that some years ago that they, they suddenly became exposed you could walk to the edge of the river and you could see these rapids right there on the river and what uh, and I laid something out that I wanted to do, and uh, the response uh, that was given back to me through somebody else because I wasn't particularly effective with that city manager, so I used a conduit to get there, and um, and they were they were essentially told, I'm not worried about that. Why are you? And the you know that's that's getting you nowhere, and I have uh, struggled with wanting to emphasize and turn our face to the river for a long time. Even when we um, did some, some backfill in there after a flood, I said, no, let's keep it, let's slope it. Let's get that, let's drop that bank down and let's get people to be able to put their feet in the water. Um, why would we not want to open that river up to recreation? Why would we not want to engage the, the bird watching and all of the other things that can go on there? Why would we turn our back to the river? We've got a river. Every other city that's got a river in the country gets to gets to enjoy it, gets to turn it into an amenity passion, gets gets to engage with that river and turn it into that they have identity with that river. We have identity with our river, but we don't engage it. And you're, like I said, I'm a planner at heart, and my 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 gaze has been on that river for a couple of decades or more. Uh, really, we need to. We need to engage the community in that river and turn it into a recreational draw. It's a beautiful river, especially once you get up near those rapids. It's and amazing. the way you would do that, um, Keith, would be in what way? How, how would you concretely move in that direction? Well, it's one of those kind of things that I mentioned about my father. He just decided to do it. I would uh, I'd put together a small team on the organization and say, okay, 
how, you show me how we can get here. And I think I would probably get ideas of engagement with the Border Patrol, but we own a lot of that property out there. It's our land. Uh, well, the we'll see once, once the, the land, wall even, comes even, in, we'll even see the, <laughs> how that changes Yeah, things. even even the land, uh, well, the wall is, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens with that wall um, and where that wall gets placed. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, I, my knee jerk on that wall is that the, the current crisis was not created by the, by the wall, but more of a threat of the wall um, in terms of the massive migration trying to come across. Um, the threat of the wall has led to led to that migration, but, but uh, anyway, so you'd have a team. The, the, the wall the wall impacts that. Yes. We if we if we get a wall, that engagement with the river as a community asset can't happen. Right. You get anything. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Garcia, thank you, sir. The Via Laredo, <laughs> the Via Laredo, comprehensive plan was a citizen intensive endeavor that requires a scorecard, a yearly progress report of each goals and policies with proposed timelines uh, for meeting milestones. Okay. Please explain how your administration can implement a strategic plan and how the progress to communicate to the public and to the council. Please provide an example on how you might accelerate uh, the Laredo Comprehensive Plan. Your, P, your PIO is going to be key in that, in terms of communicating that out and getting that message out. And, and uh, the departments are going to be key in that engagement process, which you, you've already got. The implementation is also going to be at the department level. And then you've got to budget for it. Well, what you've got to do in each of those scenarios, for each of those initiatives, that got, you've got to develop a, a work strategy, a work plan to how to meet that threshold, how to get there. And that department needs to do that. <laughs> the department, I'm not familiar with the document. Um, I'm not familiar with what those may be. But if it sets some timelines, um, then we as an organization, and it was done at the community level, we need to be cognizant of who we serve. And if that thing came from the ground up, from the community, then we need to be looking at setting milestones and establishing a methodology and a path to get there. But as, as, as a city manager, what would your what would your recommendation to that committee as the leader of our community on a scorecard and how are we going to how are we going to do this and making sure that you know what you're at you're at, you're the boss and, and making sure that all this is being done mm -hmm. is being communicated to the right people and it's being executed right because we can give us every assignment that we want but if we're not if we're not at the head ahead of it you're right. pushing it she's not going to get anything done in the river we're not going to get anything done in, in our plan Budget's going to be all over the place because there's no leadership. How are you how are you going to put how, what scorecard are you going to put in there? Yeah, and how are you going to monitor that to make sure that you know what this is what we plan. I want to report. Council needs to know. The community needs to know. One of the things that that I uh, engaged with is. <coughs> not quite going to come up, is it? Okay. If you go down towards the fourth from the bottom, the performance report is invigorated. We had, we had a, a system of performance measures in our organization, but they were also, some of those uh, CPRs were project driven as well. You have to keep things on track. That's, my role will be to make sure that the ACMs keep those things on track. It's the ACM that is going to carry the brunt of the weight to make sure those things happen. I mentioned that earlier about uh, some of the implementation of the activities. The, AC, the role of the ACM is to ensure that those things happen through those departments, that those departments are reaching those milestones and reaching those goals in that, uh, in, in that performance of those tasks. Sometimes that's just that uh, CPR is a, a report card on the, on the team. But in some cases, it's a report card on the um, on the task at hand. Okay, you've got to you've got to have that task front and center, and you've got to have a department that's got buy-in to do it, and you've got to have an ACM that's making sure they're staying on path. I mentioned the budget initiatives. Some of these things are going to be budget-driven issues. 
So in the budget, we're going to approve something. Or something's going to happen in the budget to make one element of those things happen that you just described. Well, as soon as that happens in the budget, what we will do is we'll go right back and formulate the strategy and the plan of that budget initiative to ensure that it happens within that budget cycle. You have to push those things through the cycle. You have to keep them nailed into the cycle. Thank you. And that goes on. Um, and, and a few of these, uh, these things that I've listed here as accomplishments while I was uh, the interim director there at Corpus Christi, some of these things were things that were on the slope. They were on the slope path, believe it or not. Um, older bond projects moving forward. We, we still have projects from 2012, 2008, that had not been done in Corpus Christi. So this is not new to organizations, and we got those things moving. Uh, we upgraded our water and wastewater plants. And we did this uh, performance uh, report. That capital budgeting division, I uh, don't know if we have one here, but that capital budgeting division was really key, and it's a part of our, our budget department. But it's a division in the budget department, and having someone work on the creation of that CIP and then follow, following the implementation of that CIP from a pure budgetary standpoint is key uh, to seeing them implemented, seeing those projects get done. A um, couple of things we did in development services, we, we established a portal where you could get your permits and we got that up and running and we also went out to the street and got a strategic plan done. Um, we did a utility rate review. And for, I formed a committee. I formed it. I said, and, and I picked some of the brightest people in our community and said, we need you to understand water rates and we need to channel what we're going to do in water rates through you. And they did a complete from the ground north on water rates. And I told them, I said, by the time you get done with this, you'll know more about water rates <coughs> than I do by a long shot. And they did. And, and they came forward and presented a recommendation to city council. The, um, we did a bond election. I, 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 uh, I did some things before we got to that bond election. I want to talk about that a little bit. And we talk about funding. A lot of the, the questions here have oriented around funding. Uh, even though you didn't, it didn't come out and say, how are you going to fund that? But everything is a function of funding. It's the budget that's, that uh, implements. The budget implements policy. That's what the budget does. The, and so one of the discussions we had, the, the city council wanted to make sure that they got some money to do residential streets. Our type B, when it was voted for, was very constrained. 50% of whatever came in on the type B went to economic development. Of that remaining 50%, 500 went over, 500,000 went over to housing. The remaining portion is to be used on arterials and collectors, not local streets, but arterials and collectors. What I proposed to them was to build those, those projects into the bond, because you got two separate sections of your, of your tax rate, right? You got M and O and INS. You got these two things that are working. Each one has a different rate. And as you've adopted your tax rate, you got two different two different numbers that you're adopting in that process. So what I did was I said, let's take our B, let's get our debt, let's take our B, let's bring it into the INS to pay for the debt, perfectly legit under the way the type B was adopted at, at the referendum. And then, I've hit that about six times, and then take the move what you just freed up under INS over to the M&O. And then through that mechanism, you've now got money at the M&O to spend on the local streets. Project specific. Wouldn't have necessarily have to be, but you were going to free up money in your M&O. You were going to bring more money into your M&O out of your INS. I was already bringing money <coughs> out of the INS anyway. We were, we, we had, our, our INS was a little high. We were building a fund balance in there that we didn't need to have. So because of valuations, valuations went up, but the INS was staying flat. So we were building fund balance. So what I did was I took a penny out of, I took a penny out of the INS, moved it over to the M&O. That also gave me the ability to what I said earlier in funding the police and fire academies to go beyond um, the attrition rate. That's, that's really key. Those guys have to get beyond attrition rates because population is growing, they can't stay stagnant. And that's how, how we funded their academies. Um, and that, that's, 
I probably lost a few of you there. If I had a Sharpie and a whiteboard, I'd probably walk you through that a little better. Um, but that was important discussion to have for the council because that really engaged the council on their streets, how they're going to fund streets and what it really looks like and how are we going to maintain our streets. And, and that took them through that discussion of the tax rate, took, him, took them through that entire process of street maintenance and street reconstruction. We have uh, we got about ten minutes left in regards to this process. Uh, that concludes the, the topics of discussion. Uh, uh, so I'd like to, you know, I want to give an, an opportunity for uh, Mr. Selman to do some closing remarks. But is there a question? I want to go to each aisle. I go to one side. I'll allow one question on each side. And one question on the other side. For a for a, a question that was that you would like to address that was done within. You know your area, so go ahead. I do have a question. Go ahead, Ms. Gale. Thank you, Mr. That. Chairman. <laughs> um, Keith, in your um, resume, you talk about that you finalized a non-curtailment agreement with industrial water users, ensuring industries will have water during times of drought. Right. Can well, you be more specific that? on how you open these lines of communication? Um, interestingly <coughs> enough, the the industry in Corpus Christi is very willing to engage on a lot of those discussions. Uh, there is a group, they're, they're, they have an industry group and they have a presiding person there and then there are other people that represent that industry that came into this, this, uh, this group. So it wasn't hard to, to, to get this group together. One of the things that the industry saw was with the coming on of, of Exxon, Exxon was a big water user, that that diminished our Product. Once they get online, then we got this much room at the top. Well, once steel gets on, then that guy gets there. So what they wanted to do was provide a mechanism to ensure that their water wouldn't be shut off and wouldn't be shut off first. Because potentially you're gonna you're gonna look to preserve your residents, and then you're you're, you're you're gonna cut industry off at some point in there. So what they were willing to do was actually impose themselves with a fee. And the intent of that fee is to capitalize another water source and to capitalize having that water, generating that water that they, to meet their industrial needs. And they, it's 25 cents uh, per thousand. It's not a small amount. So that, that actually, that money is seven digits now, and that was just done a year ago, a year and a half ago, not a year ago. So it, uh, it was, it's a very smart idea. It's what's kind of leading the uh, leading the charge on the desal, and uh, we're looking at getting permits over there for uh, that uh, the seawater desal. One of the things that I think is really important is the water portfolio diversification. Um, you know, they're not not doing aquifer storage or anything like that over there just yet, but they are looking to diversify their portfolio in any way. Uh, seawater desal is one. We currently have surface water. We got Lake Corpus Christi and Chacon, uh, uh, Chocan, excuse me. So you've got those things uh, out there right now in terms of a surface water. And we also have access to the Colorado uh, as well. But you know, expanding that portfolio to desal sort of makes some sense. So that's, that's really how that whole thing stimulated. It was kind of them coming to us, us coming to them, what are we going to do kind of thing. So it, it rolled all, almost all by itself. Now, getting to that 25 cents and getting to the agreement was a little bit trickier because they wanted to cap it and they wanted to, to define when a plant would be built and they wanted to do a lot of things in there. So that's really what happened in that negotiation was, okay, what's going to happen with this money and when is it going to happen? That was the real negotiation. They were always willing to, to tax themselves a little bit more to give themselves a, a surety of water. But, uh, but then how that, that money got spent was, uh, was what that negotiation really entailed. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm going to allow one question on this side as well, okay. <laughs> and because it's a term. Yeah. Uh, this is one that I've already asked the, you know, the other candidates, so I want to get it up, Mr. Stone. Okay. Uh, like in city operation, uh, in city operation, like in any business, uh, it's very important that you have, you know, productivity, efficiency, uh, safety, employee training, accountability, timeliness, customer service, and uh, measures that you can use to improve what you're doing. Right. Um, what can you tell me about standard operating procedures? What value do they provide? Have you used them in the past? And do departments that report to you currently have written SOPs in place? 
Some yes, some no. Right now, I'm working with my municipal court on developing SOPs. Uh, we have SOPs in our IT division. That was at my direction uh, while I was interim. They didn't have SOPs. We were at, we were at risk in a lot of different areas. Um, our UBO did not have a set of SOPs. Those two were drafted while I was uh, interim city manager, and and they're essential. You have to have that SOP. You can't if if you're doing something on a regular basis. Your, your standard operating procedures is it, it needs to get nailed down, and this is why I, I, in, municipal court is one place. Uh, in, in Corpus Christi, our municipal court judge is not elected. Our municipal court judge is appointed by the council, but we still have the segregation of activities for the administration of the municipal court and the opera, and then the court itself. Uh, the, the judges they're they're separate. Uh, the administration of it comes under me. We had. Uh, Frankly, our, our, our judge was dissatisfied with what was going on at the administrative level. And that's when we started this engagement um, to, to work through and to get to a point where we're developing SOPs. They're about half done. They're not finished yet. Mr. But, it's, but the, answer, the answer to your question is, yeah, you've got to have SOPs, particularly in something that you do every time, all the time by road. And most importantly, um, when, you're, when you're a service provider in the organization, uh, UBO is utility billing office. They're the ones that send out the water bills. They needed SOPs. Um, IT, how they deal with things, they need, uh, they need some SOPs. I just want to, I just, I just want to, we have three minutes, and I just want to make sure we prepare to everyone. So either you want to have some closing remarks, or you'd like to take the question? I'll take the question, and then do I get another bell in one minute? Just very quickly. Yeah. Um, that question and, and count against us. To follow up with Mrs. Galo and other, uh, you, you brought it up, the, the new Exxon plant, and how have you approached um, community opposition to that Petrochem build-out on the coast? Um, that's not specific to Corpus, but, you know. It, it's, it's not right? specific to Corpus, you're right. But a lot of that stuff has happened over in San Patricio, and, uh, and we've allowed that. That we we've not been in that engagement over in San Patricio. It's been the port has been uh, involved. Can, can EDC has been involved. Well, I'll say, so this question, all questions should be pretty much to remember that all are candidates, and this is not one of them. So we yeah. have to stay within. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious because it's very specific to a project that they're developing in that city, mm -hmm. and Mo most of the charges at San Pat, and are, with the, with the EDC and the port, that was the issue with the port. Just so you know. Okay. That's why Sam Powell has allow, a presence in the floor. Let me allow you to hear some closing remarks that already okay. questions that you may have of us. No, nope, I, I have no questions. Um, I, I just, uh, and my closing remarks are not very, not very long either. Um, and, and what I'd really like to speak to is uh, a couple of things that, uh, that, you know, why I want to come back and that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, uh, I was deeply moved, and, and I don't know if any of you saw it, but I was deeply moved when I left. Uh, there was people here in the Planning and Zoning Commission, and each one of them came up, and, and a, a Planning and Zoning Commissioner <coughs> who hated me at one time got up and cried. <laughs> she got up and cried. So, and it wasn't you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but I was deeply moved by that, and, and, uh, and, and Laredo became home. I, I, I've lived in Laredo longer than I've ever lived anywhere else, very much home. I got one minute. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's the big thing. Um, coming, coming, coming. I have passion for the community. I have passion for the organization, and uh, and I'm excited uh, to know where both can go because I uh, and, and setting a vision for for taking both the city and the and the organization to new heights. I'm excited about that because all the potential is there. The river is mentioned. The, the trade, you know, all of these things are in place. We just need to have the will to do it. We just need to have the will. Um, you've got an important task. Um, a lot of times in these uh, city manager searches, the word that gets put in is fit. Are they a good fit for the organization? Right? But fit for what? <laughs> that's that's what you, you're dealing with. Is, it, is that individual a fit for the community? Is that individual a fit for the council collective? Is that individual a fit for the council individual? And is that a fit for the organization? And finally, 
uh, is that a fit to accommodate the desires of, of the public? Okay. Well, I want to thank you for coming back to Laredo and being part of this process. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity. Thrilled, thrilled to be here. Good. <coughs> uh, so, there will be no further questions and then no further discussion. We'll take a break now for lunch. And, um, pardon me? <laughs> it's coming. on its way. Okay. They gave, they, they gave me bread and water. And, uh, <laughs> and water. So they were very kind. Very kind. Uh, best of luck to you and uh, safe you. travels back, back, back to Corpus Christi. Okay. Well, my in laws are still alive and still here in town. Oh, good. My, my good. father in law is 100 years old. Oh, uh, my mother in law is 93. Well, They're going to have That's right. Uh, so we, have, we, we do it, we do it at the 30th.